<clears throat> All righty. Good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today uh, for uh, this year's Edward Said, the 2022 Edward Said Memorial Rec Lecture. My name is Faraz Zagab, the pro program manager here at the Jerusalem Fund. Uh, a pledge, and I welcome you all here online. Before we get started, I would just like to ask you to please continue to support us by watching these events and tell your, fr your friends and family about us. And uh, if you can please donate to the Jerusalem Fund and Palestine Center so that we can continue to put on these events. It's much appreciated. And well, I welcome you from wherever you are today. Uh, today we have Jennifer Zakaria, and an attorney and a writer. She holds a uh, JD from Columbia Law, Law School and an MIA, uh, an MIA from Columbia School of International and Public Affairs, a graduate of the University of California at Berkeley. She has worked as a journalist and with various human and civil rights organizations. She is also Sharina Baakli's first cousin. And we also have the moderator, Saeed Ariqat, who is a member of the Palestine Center Committee. And, uh, and the Washington Bureau Chief for the Palestinian newspaper Al-Quds, a daily for which he is a writer, columnist, and analyst. He previously served as spokesman and director of public information for the United Nations Assistant Mission for Iraq and currently teaches as an adjunct professor at American University in Washington, D.C. Um, and I'll hand it off to Saeed. Thank you, Haras, and uh, thank you, Jennifer. I, for some reason, unable to, to see uh, Jennifer, so there we are. Yeah, now now I can see you, and we always have some 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 issues with electronics, but we eventually get it you know back on track. And uh, this is of course a great honor to uh, to meet you and uh, to have you uh, update us on uh, the issue of that lecture itself it is a great honor for me to be moderating the annual uh, Memorial uh, Edward Said lecture. Uh, and of course, uh, Edward Said is larger than lot was larger than life, uh, was a friend and a mentor and, and all these things. And, oh. uh, you know, in my class, uh, I teach a, a course on media. And I always, uh, of course, uh, introduce my students to his books and articles and so on. So, uh, Without uh, further ado, I turn it over to you, Jennifer. Thank you, thank you, Sai. Um, thank you to the Jerusalem Fund for inviting me to speak today at the Edward Said Memorial Lecture. It's an honor to be here. Um, it's difficult to believe that four days ago was the 19th anniversary of Edward Said's passing. He was my father-in-law and our family, along with countless others, have missed his presence and voice every day since then. We continue to look to his work as foundational and a source of inspiration. It has also been 20 weeks since Israeli soldiers killed my cousin, Shireen Abu Akli, while she was reporting on yet another military raid in Janine. Today, I hope to reflect on the power of both of them and to honor their memories, <clears throat> some of their contributions and how their work and their legacies intersect, reinforce each other and continue to shape and provide help for the future. On May 11th, Shireen was shot by an Israeli soldier. Since then, we have had to contend with the Israeli government's alternating denials, silence, and obfuscations. What has been worse is the Biden administration's endorsement of Israel's efforts to declare the issue closed by essentially rubber stamping the Israeli narrative of it being an unintentional shooting and one for which any follow-up is unnecessary. By cheapening the concept of accountability, the US has been complicit in attempting to scuttle efforts to attain justice for Shireen. We are grateful to those members of Congress who have countered the State Department's approach and demanded measures appropriate in response to the killing of a US citizen abroad by a foreign government. Of course, despite Israeli claims to the contrary, Palestinians and anyone who takes the time to read or watch the countless reports analyzing the circumstances under which Shireen was killed by CNN, Al Jazeera, Hyun, Rights Watch, the UN, Amnesty International, Bellingcat, El Haq, Forensic Architecture, to name a few, know that the Israelis killed Shireen deliberately. Today, contrary to the ridiculous Israeli and US characterization of the killing as unintentional, I would like to investigate why, in fact, the Israelis targeted Shireen as a member of the press. <clears throat> we know that the Israeli military consistently kills Palestinians and those that ally themselves with them. 
We know also that there has been an ongoing practice of targeting journalists and medics who bravely attempt to document and respond to the rampant brutality of the Israeli army. Less than a month after Shireen was shot, Israelis killed 31-year-old journalist Guthron Warasin. Since 2000, Israel has killed at least 26 journalists and injured more than 300. Still, the assassination of Shireen was the targeting of a high-profile, well-recognized figure wearing a clearly marked press vest and helmet, and it is, even by Israeli standards, an especially egregious and attention-generating act. The response to Shireen's death, both in the immediate aftermath with the unprecedented turnout for her funeral in Jerusalem and the slew of awards and events after to commemorate her life, have demonstrated even more clearly the role she played nationally and regionally. In many ways, Shireen is a very visible, widely adored proxy for the many courageous journalists in Palestine who worked alongside her and have continued to do so after her death. I believe the Israeli tar Israelis targeted Shireen for three main reasons. One, she told the stories of Palestinians and was a critical part of representing the lives and experiences of Palestinians in their own right. In so doing, she helped to produce an ongoing record of Palestinian existence. Two, she provided Palestinians and Arabs comfort and hope on both the bleakest and most ordinary days. And three, she was a voice that represented the unity and continuity of Palestinians. This is true both geographically and chronologically. In all these ways, she was the quintessential, sorry, she was the quintessential intellectual that Saeed posited there was an urgent need for in so much of his writing as he expounded upon in his classic work from 1993, Representations of the Intellectual. Specifically, Saeed defined an intellectual as an individual endowed with a faculty for representing, embodying, articulating a message, a view, an attitude, philosophy, or opinion to as well for, as well as for a public. And this role has an edge to it and cannot be played without a sense of being someone whose place it is publicly to raise embarrassing questions, to confront orthodoxy and dogma rather than to produce them to be someone who cannot easily be co-opted by governments or corporation and whose raison d'etre is to represent all those people and issues that are routinely forgotten or swept under the rug. The intellectual does so on the basis of universal principles that all human beings are entitled to expect decent standards of behavior concerning freedom and justice from worldly powers of nations and that deliberate or inadvertent violations of these standards need to be testified and fought against courageously." End quote. Journalism provides an opportunity to perform the role of intellectual as defined by Said, and is especially necessary in places where human rights violations are so rampant and take place with such impunity. As is well recognized, Shireen worked tirelessly to bring attention to the unceasing wave of human rights violations against Palestinians. During his life, Said often spoke of the need for testimonials and facts to be recorded because, as he wrote, human beings must create their own history. In response to Israel's designs to, in his words, reduce Palestinian existence as much as possible, he felt also that a robust archive would counter the Israeli drive to silence Palestinians and to portray their identities as a one-dimensional response to their own rich and robust identity. Indeed, the official Israeli narrative positives, posits that Palestinians take shape only on a reactionary plane. What I mean is that all Palestinian existence is seen solely through the lens of how it impacts Israelis. Palestinians' quest for freedom becomes wishing for Israel's demise. Resistance to occupation becomes terrorism and violence, as if they exist in a vacuum. Indeed, since the creation of the State of Israel, Palestinian existence has been seen as an inconvenient and breakable thorn in their side, rather than an entire other people entitled to rights and aspirations. Instead of being allowed to articulate their own needs, desires, or rights, Said explains that Palestinians are expected to participate in the dismantling of their own history. This is demonstrated with the unending demands of Israel and its supporters that Palestinian textbooks be revised to omit their actual history in as much as that history is seen as unfavorable or counter to the Israeli narrative. This mentality is also borne out in regards to the press when we consider the reaction of Israeli military spokesperson Kohav Ron on army radio the day Shireen was killed when he accused her and her colleagues of being armed with cameras. 
Over three decades of reporting, Shireen created a narrative of Palestine and Palestinians about themselves and their experiences. She consistently documented the contours of life under occupation, the history of Palestinians, the excruciating details of imprisonments, killings, house demolitions, bombing campaigns, and she did these things all while living in their midst. She spoke to the people who in the West have been relegated to largely nameless, faceless numbers with the label teller, terrorist or militant tagged in front of them, making any subsequent detail or nuance irrelevant and unnecessary. But Shireen lived in those details and she brought them to life. She told the stories of the people so consistently otherwise silenced or erased. In fact, Saeed could have been speaking about her directly when he writes that intellectuals are individuals with a vocation for the art of representing, whether that is talking, writing, teaching, appearing on television, and that vocation is important to the extent that it is publicly, publicly recognizable and involves both commitment and risk, boldness and vulnerability. We see that Israel is adamant in its efforts to silence Palestinians any time they attempt to record their stories or bolster their narrative through collecting facts and information. In fact, attempts to silence those who document the plight of Palestinians goes beyond Shireen and her colleagues and has international reach. As most of you probably followed, on August 18th, the Israeli army broke into seven human rights organizations it had baselessly labeled terrorist entities last October. In line with a military order declaring al haq and six other organizations illegal groups, Israeli soldiers ransacked the offices of the groups and removed their archives before sealing each office by welding its door shut to prevent access. Importantly, the Israeli agenda was to stop the ongoing work of these organizations whose purpose is to document violations of the collective and individual rights of Palestinians in the occupied territories. <clears throat> Removing the records or archives of groups the Israeli state targets directly seeks to hinder Palestinians creating a historical record of their own experiences while giving Israel access to data it has no business having. The Israeli military extracting Palestinian archives is nothing new, with perhaps the most infamous and symbolic example of the practice being its wholesale confiscation, wholesale confiscation of the entirety of the archives of the Palestinian Research Center, i.e. the archive of the Palestinian National Movement in Beirut in 1982. Of course, the efforts to silence and chill actions by Palestinians and their supporters to document their history and peacefully advocate for their liberation are not limited to the Middle East. In the United States, we literally have hundreds of proposed laws at the state and federal level to outlaw the boycott, divest, and sanctions movement, many of which have been successfully passed. Efforts like this are a part of a wide ranging campaign to shut down both nonviolent resistance and the dissemination of information about the reality of life under occupation. This phenomenon is present not only at the official or government level, as a recent report commissioned by Meta documents Facebook and Instagram's repeated censorship of Palestinian activists and content with the most obvious effect being the silencing of Palestinian voices on social media platforms. Since Shireen's death, we've been told countless stories of what she meant to so many. Those who met her once, those who knew her well, and those who saw her only on television all reported their overwhelming sadness at her absence. They relayed how she covered story, stories with respect and professionalism and compassion that she made every person she interacted with seem feel, feel seen and heard, that in her telling of other people's stories, people saw themselves, their neighbors, and in that they found refuge. She imbued every report with empathy and sincerity. People told us how comforting it was to hear her reports. She was someone who could be trusted and believed, and who also believed in the people whose stories she brought to wide audiences. She told the truth and told it even when it was dangerous to do so. Shireen documented the lives of people amidst their suffering and in their more mundane moments. She spoke of victories and celebrations as well. 
Shireen's journalism demonstrated acutely that Palestinians are, as James Baldwin said, more than our pain. I've been told by many that they found it calming to hear her voice and reassuring to turn on the TV and see her in any of the various locations from where she reported. Shireen comforted us and comfort is synonymous with hope. When we are comforted, when we are seen, when we are represented, we feel like we are not alone. As Bell Hook said, one of the most vital ways we sustain ourselves is by building communities of resistance, places where we know we are not alone. Shireen also gave voice to people who lost loved ones, belongings, dignity, seemingly in silence. When the world seems to not pay attention to the plight of Palestinians and they feel unheard, unseen in their suffering and the injustice of it, Shireen and her colleagues were there with a camera and a microphone. In feeling heard, we feel hope, and hope, as Hooks also noted, is essential to any political struggle for radical change when the overall social climate promotes disillusionment and despair. For this reason, obviously, hope is dangerous to those who seek to crush the spirit of others. Shireen also reported on Palestinians in a way that represented a shared past and future. She spoke about Palestinian history from before 1948 in a continuous manner. Her last report was about sports in Palestine, and she covered the entire history of it in a remarkable way. Even while reporting on the physically divisive barriers and walls and checkpoints, she spoke of us as a collective. In her language and voice, we were whole, even as she documented the concerted effort to dispossess and annihilate us. What she said and the unspoken assumptions from which she delivered her reports reaffirmed our identity and our existence. She provided a forum for testimonial of our suffering. She drew linkages where they exist, rejecting silently but surely all the Israeli attempts to fracture us from each other. She knew that the strongest case for the Palestinians lived in the facts by presenting the day-to-day -day life and loss of Palestinians. And she created an archive of what occupation and dispossession look like. In the truest sense, such endeavors fulfill Saeed's statement that the purpose of the intellectual's activity is to advance human freedom and knowledge. In telling our stories, Shireen and the many brave journalists who continue the work, create a world where we could imagine ourselves as an unbroken whole, unified in our experiences and aspirations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer. I mean, that is really a, a very compelling presentation. And uh, of course, it's material for much discussion uh, that I and others will be sort of questioning you on or seeking answers or analysis from you on. I, I, I myself like just to say a couple of things. I knew Shireen, and I reported with Shireen a couple of times. I had the honor of reporting with her from here, from the State Department, you know, from the briefing room, you know, which completely, completely, uh, you know, a, a completely dis went along with the with the Israeli narrative and the Israeli story. So uh, uh, I know how uh, how Palestinians uh, feel. Uh, the most amazing thing is what you mentioned. Almost every Palestinian family built or they still feel like they knew Shireen. They knew like they knew her personally. It's amazing. I mean, I talked to people in my village. I'm from Obadim, so outside of Jerusalem. And they say, yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they, each one of them feels that they like know her on a personal level. She's been there. She's been to all these places. She's been around. She's part of the Palestinian story for the better part of, the, uh, of two decades or more. Uh, it's, a, it's an amazing thing, at least two decades. You know, so she was omnipresent in that sense. And I think that is really, I mean, as you mentioned, the three reasons why the Israelis would want uh, to, to eliminate someone like uh, Shreem. But that, above all, she did give the Palestinians hope. She did uh, give them comfort. She uh, she told their story to, to the world. She was omnipresent everywhere, everywhere, you know. And anyone that tells you that it was not intentional, which is what the Israelis say and what the Americans uh, are saying uh, in defense of really a group of gangsters. They can call themselves an army, whatever they want, but it's a gangster state, a gangster state and a gangster army, you know, because 
the day they, they killed Shuri, one of my colleagues in my newspaper, Alice Moody, was also shot. He was shot first. I mean, you know, so it's, a, you know, it's not this, the, you know, they were responding to fire and they have some sort of a stray bullet go. I mean, they, they hit, they were targeting the Germans. No question about that, you know. And as you mentioned, you know, Rufran Roussan was killed <laughs> a few weeks later in Hebron. A young uh, woman, 31 years old, you know, nobody talked about her, no one. Uh, no investigation, no demand, nothing of the sort. And this is this is where you know, the hypocrisy uh, of America stands so stark. I mean, you know, uh, yesterday I remember in the briefing we had a back and forth with the spokesperson, uh, you know, uh, about how the U.S. sanctioned uh, the moral the morality police in, in, in Iran for the death of the young woman Massa. Uh, I mean, as as they should. I mean, you know, uh, and but immediately they did not investigate. They did not do. Any, in other words, they were saying that this was intentional by the morality uh, police, and, and which may very well have been. But then they insist that you know, Shireen, uh, kill, the killing of Shireen was not intentional, and that is uh, the hypocrisy. Uh, and I think this is really in uh, and of itself is. Um, Tell us why Israel feels it can't kill Shireen. And it can, as they did today, they chased a seven-year-old boy to his death. They chased a seven-year-old boy to his death this morning, and they get away with it. They killed the assassinated four Palestinians yesterday. Every day, there's not a, a day that goes by without uh, doing this. So uh, I don't know. I mean, this is, despite uh, the fact that Shireen's story, you know, that the U.S. administration insisted that it was really a tragic incident, which of course it's a tragedy for the Palestinians. It's very tragic, but it goes unpunished. It will go unpunished. And my question to you, I like to end this discussion, is why the Palestinian story or Shireen's story, indeed, you know, does not resonate with the public. Although, I mean, there was, the, like you mentioned, uh, there's a position by. Um, a number of congressmen and senators and legislators refuse uh, just to, you know, to accept the, uh, the Israeli narrative or the American narrative. But still, why such a story <coughs> is not resonating more than it has or more than it is? Um, I mean, I think I think that we've seen um, a lot more response to Shireen's death from a lot wider of a group of people than we have to a lot of the other atrocities, some of which, you know, you just mentioned, and there's obviously a long list of those um, that go back a long time. Um, but so I do think there's there has been some significant progress in terms of getting different groups and different people, as I mentioned, you know, a good number of, they said something like half the number of half the Democratic senators um, signs this letter and Leahy has the um, is pushing to have basically hold them accountable, is the Israelis accountable, um, and do a thorough investigation, and um, otherwise to use the Leahy law to perhaps um, to basically take away the funding um, for Israel because of these actions, which is you know that's pretty unprecedented in terms of a governmental level, high governmental level action on behalf of the loss of a Palestinian life. Um, I think what, what we're contending with, though, is um, decades of dehumanization and really active, you know, speaking of the sort of opposite role that the that Edward Said talks about when he talks about being an intellectual or being a journalist that acts as an intellectual um, um, or a government figure that acts in the role as of, of someone who's critical and who thinks before they're doing things. There's a, such a long history of active dehuma, dehumanizing of Palestinians. Um, you know, at the beginning of um, the invasion of Ukraine, they had that picture of Ahed Tamimi uh, going around and um, and everyone thought it was a Ukrainian girl. So everyone was, oh, this amazing, brave Ukrainian girl. And then it was like, oh, they found out she was Palestinian. There's like silence, you know, and um, I'm really glad she's coming. She came out with a book now. I'm looking forward to reading that uh, with Dina Takuri. So uh, I think things are changing. I think um, I think they're not changing as fast as we want them to. And I think sometimes it's um, one step forward and two steps back. But 
I think to contend with this overall dehumanizing of Palestinians, that's been a very conscious effort and the ongoing attempts to silence Palestinians, as you know, I mentioned, even our you know, nonviolent resistance, even our, um, our social media activity, it's, it's pretty um, wide ranging. The, so I think that's a hard thing for us to battle. I think what we can do is, you know, kind of keep up Shireen's work and Edward Said's work and, and what lots of people now are really trying to get get the information out there and um, and and inform people about what the Palestinian experience was and continues to be, so. Yeah, you know, I, of course, I mean, uh, there is, you know, as you mentioned, there is a, a great deal of uh, support. There's an outrage. I mean, there was a lot of outrage in the briefing room, I remember among, among my fellow journalists and so on, uh, that uh, do actually and go out to places uh, where, of conflict and so on, and they are in harm play and they could. So there is that aspect of it, but also uh, there is, you know, uh, as, as, you, as you said, the Palestinians are only seen through the Israeli lens, you know, on how, uh, and, uh, and how they impact uh, uh, Israel. Uh, nothing else. This remains, you know, very persistent. This, you know, sure we have, we. I can see uh, that uh, the Palestinian cause is getting more exposure. You know, the on campuses in many areas among, you know, progressive Democrats. Uh, it's uh, it is also changing. I saw um, an article in Five Thirty Eight just published that thing on Monday or, or last week. I, I mean, a few days, a couple of days ago, and so on. How uh, you know, uh, for Democrats, let's say under 25, uh, the Palestinian, there's a great deal of support for the Palestinian cause. But still, you know, the persistence of this dehumanizing by this administration, as with past administration, I mean, nothing has changed. You know, this is, I am amazed at their rhetoric. I mean, they keep saying, we want to see the same levels of dignity, whatever that means, for Palestinians and Israelis. When in fact, you know, there is one occupying power, there is one one people that are consistently and constantly being dehumanized uh, and targeted and attacked and so on. So, this is what I'm, uh, you know, that's what I'm trying to sort of break through. Of course, I mean, you know, uh, the late Edward Said spoke a great deal about about the discrimination or about the racism uh, that is inherent in, in Western cultures and so on towards. Uh, uh, Muslims and Arabs and and people of color and and, and people uh, uh, you know from Asia and, and so on uh, and there were I mean I I, sh I show my students constantly films like the uh, the real uh, news Arab and so on by Shaheen and so on so we we see this and this continues to persist but when it comes to such a prominent journalist to such a prominent a uh, Palestinian American girl, you know, who was all over the place just, you know, minutes before on, on television. And in fact, that the Israelis feel they get away with it and they did, they have, because they have, you know, a cover in this government, you know, in this town, they have that cover. You know, they have uh, legislative covers by groups that, that are called the, the Democrats for Israel, or whatever it is, by the lot different lobbies and so on, by the State Department, by the administration itself, by uh, the White House, and that's where there ought to be, you know. I don't know. Maybe there is not bravery enough or uh, creativity enough, without you know accusing anyone um, of you know keeping this this issue on on the front burner. You know, we try to do our part uh, as journalists, but still we are you know just a uh, about uh, you know a peripheral uh, voice and so on. There, there ought to be some sort of a, uh, you know more driven effort. You know, not only of course not by the family, by the family indeed, but not all, uh, only by the family. Uh, it had to be on campuses and so on. And I want to ask you, as, as you know, as an attorney, as someone you know, who uh, commands these legal issues, what the, what the best way to go about it? You know. In a legal, in legal terms, uh, to pursue this and keep it alive. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I think the attack on BDS is really dangerous. I think the thirty-four states that have um, passed uh, anti-BDS laws uh, 
that's a really, really troubling trend to take away um, Palestinians' right to peaceful protest, basically, um, to non. And um, I think that's huge because it also speaks to the um, the extremes that the government here, certain government officials, are willing to go to to um, maintain the Israeli narrative and the Israeli um, view of things, and how panicked they get when whenever any there's any breakthrough, um, and they have to sh they try to shut it down. So I think that fighting those battles um, and hopefully winning um, based on freedom of speech um, is is really important and. Um, I think there are some organizations doing really good work on that, like Palestine Legal. And um, and I think that's a huge thing. I think the free speech issues on campus are really important. And those are also getting litigated, you know, um, when there's um, too many infringements on the free speech and it crosses a line. There's been, and there's been some success on that. Um, as far as legally, you know, for in an, in an individual sense, I mean, I think, uh, you know, Sh Shireen's family and um, people who advocate for her are very active and trying to get legal, um, seek legal remedies for her internationally and here. And I think that that has the potential to um, be, have a really big impact because the end of Israeli impunity would, you know, <laughs> to, to find where the end of, of Israeli impunity is would be a useful exercise, I think. And um, so it would be, of course, critical for Shireen's family and um, those that loved her to get justice for her, but also to, um, and I think that's the focus right now of the family's efforts and um, people who are advocating for Shireen's efforts, which is to get the government to actually pursue this independent thorough investigation and to just keep pushing for it and to keep um, making sure that the issue doesn't die out and that we continue to demand it and show our senators and congress people that that's what we want um, and of course the family also filed with the um, um, press organizations to the icc yeah uh, that's another international uh option for seeking remedies. All these legal remedies are really slow. So having um, an FBI investigation is potentially the quickest of the, right. the options on that front. And as far as more generally, um, you know, the, the, the U.S. criminal justice system is really unfriendly to Palestinians and to Muslims. And there's a really uh, long history and um, Wadia Said has written extensively about how problematic that's been and how ongoing the battles for people like charities, Palestinian charities that get um, designated as terrorists. And, you know, the Holy Land Foundation is one of those cases. So I think the battles are going on legally, both, you know, specifically and generally and, um, and politically. And um, we, so far, I don't think we've had any major breakthroughs, but I think that the, the fight goes on. And I think those are all really important ways. I think the, the sort of court of public opinion is also important. And I think that you, what you mentioned about the tide turning on younger people um, is really important. I think the last time we saw significant progress in those kind of indicators, 9-11 happened and it was a massive setback. I remember a really substantial report coming out shortly before 9-11 that said, hey, we're, you know, like people are becoming more informed and, you know, feeling more solidarity with Palestinians. Right. And then after 9-11, of course, um, the entire landscape changed and people's feelings changed. And of course, the way things were constructed and presented here were very simplistic and um, fed into into that um, narrative, um, yeah. So I think I think those are uh, s some of the things going on. I'm sure there's a lot more. I... Yeah. Uh, you mentioned something about uh, the FBI investigation being the you know uh, the quickest, or uh, as I understood it, the quickest way to go about this. Can you explain a little bit about this? How how why would this be the quicker one, or how would this be the you know the uh, at least the more impact, impactful kind of approach? 
Well, I think that um, mainly quicker because um, legal legal processes are so incredibly slow. So mostly comparatively, and I didn't mean to imply that it would be simple to make it happen, but right. it's the focal. I think it's the focus right now, um, in part because it's so completely egregious for the U.S. government to not conduct an investigation in this kind of um, scenario. And because really all it takes is the political will to turn and, you know, that there's there's no reason why that couldn't happen. So that I didn't mean to imply quick as in like we're right about no, to I get understand. I'm just a, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, um, but no, I do think that it could happen if, if, if enough support was behind um, these various efforts by Congress to um, push the Biden administration. I do think that that what could be the most immediate um, thing that gets done that moves us towards justice for Shireen. And I think justice for Shireen is intricately tied to justice for Palestinians and yeah. drawing the line. In a, of, for and, and, and that would happen. I mean, you know, you mentioned the, the Lehi law, which is a great thing, you know, would stop, at least in theory, stop uh, arming Israel and so on. And, and I think most uh, uh, evidence show that the Israelis used an American for uh, uh, rifle with an uh, you know American bullet and so on probably uh, American telescope whatever uh, the sniper used to to kill Shireen to assassinate uh, Shireen but it would happen by let's say in this case a group of uh, legislators asking the Justice Department to have the FBI investigate that how it would go. Um. Uh, I mean, I think I think basically there there would be them bending to the political pressure of of that, and I, um, you know, I mean, the State Department makes decisions separate right. from from these other branches. Right. So I think a lot of it is about showing that people are serious and they're sticking with it. And if they get they get enough pressure, I think that they could be pressured into it, especially from other elected officials, high ranking elected officials. Mm -hmm. um, you know, can definitely uh, put enough pressure, I think, on the State Department to feel like it needs to act because it, um, you know, it hasn't been, <laughs> it hasn't yet. So, and well, you know, I tell you what, a great deal, I mean, positive, some positive things have uh, uh, taken place in the last couple of years, three years, and so on. We saw uh, that Ben and Jerry, for instance, you know, uh, uh, deciding to end its operations and uh, the West Bank settlement, occupied West Bank settlement, uh, and so on. Uh, and, you know, despite multiple efforts by the Israelis to sort of go about and around, whether it's the original, the, uh, the owning company or something else and so on, this uh, still stands. We've seen, now we've seen that booking, for instance, booking.com is saying, I'm not going to uh, book people in the uh, occupied West Bank. So that's a, a great thing we've seen, you know, great many uh, efforts uh, at this level, but also the flip side of this, we've seen, you know, these uh, uh, right-wing Democrats, Democrats for Israel and so on, uh, that are basically um, you know, financed by APAC and other lobby groups and so on. They are also on the offensive. Every time there is an effort uh, to do something, there is a counter, uh, a, a counter effort. So uh, this is a, a good thing. And that's, that's uh, also, you, you mentioned, BDS and the movements of BDS and the movement on campuses uh, and uh, and all that. I think that also is a great thing. So I'm not saying where there's no progress. Quite the contrary, there's a lot of progress. I mean, I remember I was out there in front of uh, the Capitol uh, when uh, uh, Lena Barclay and and uh, Shireen's brother had their uh, uh, press conference, and there were Congress uh, men and women uh, and present there in the press conference. There were letters, uh, there was a letter from Senator Van Halen, Chris Van Halen of Maryland, and so on. There were other letters. So there is, I mean, you know, the, uh, definitely this is not, uh, it, it's a big step. I think probably 20, 30 years ago, this would not uh, have happened. So there is uh, progress. Uh, let me turn to you on the academic level. I mean, you know, it is a question that I ask uh, Peter Beinart, you know, uh, 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 an event here at the Jerusalem Fund. And uh, we know he, he, he came out very strongly against, let's say, the, the two-state solution, saying there is no two-state solution. He's talking about, you know, Israel being an apartheid uh, 
uh, state and so on. And I asked him a question. I mean, I remember, let's say, during, and I'm old enough to, to remember the anti-apartheid movement in, in South Africa, and we were part of it as students and then as professionals in this country were also uh, in, in one form or another in you know, trying to be part uh, uh, of that movement. And I asked him, why is it uh, that the Palestinian cause with all its dynamics, I mean, we see this day after day, you know, why is it not being adopted by um, Jewish American academics who are, uh, and he's one of them, you know, he, uh, of course he's taken a different stance or, or, um, altogether. Why is it not making that impact among those groups that actually were in the forefront uh, of the, um, you know, anti apartheid movement or the civil rights movement uh, uh, in this country? I also asked with the same question to uh, Aaron Miller, who was, you know, uh, uh, who he's in Carnegie and, and uh, uh, he was a member of the um, negotiating team, the American negotiating team that um, in, the, in, in, the early 90, in the early 90s worked on the Oslo Accord and all this and, and the American team. And they really both had no answer as why it is that way. I mean, they're, so, so why in your view as, uh, you know, among, let's say, uh, American uh, academics and so on uh, in general and Jewish American academics, the adoption of the Palestinian cause or the adoption uh, of, uh, you know, this stark reality that we see daily of uh, uh, Israeli apartheid practices is not taking hold or it's not being adopted by these groups as uh, a worthy cause? Um, <clears throat> I mean, to start on a positive note, I will say that, you know, there, there have been now the Jewish Voice for Peace and there are um, substantial, um, pretty significant groups that do a lot of great work um, and I think that are really important in terms of having it be an internal conversation. Um, you know, people who are um, who are Jewish who basically will say, yeah, I believe in these principles and I believe in them across the board. And it doesn't matter whether or not, you know, um, someone claims me and my religion as their, their reason for doing what they're doing or whatever. Um, I think that as far as intellectuals, I think that it's um, it's been a long history of of um, it being very comfortable to have a complete um, hypocrisy basically on this issue. There's been no one really that challenged that challenged it, um, and for a long time, you know, Edward Said challenged it, obviously. Um, and other people, you know, definitely um, did a lot of work too. But for the most part, the conventional wisdom was that this is somehow outside of that. And there's this comfort with that um, that I think is getting upset. And um, I think, you know, not, um, I think that importantly too, and when you mentioned civil rights organizations, I mean, I think the solidarity internationally has been really important. I mean, you know, during Ferguson, you had people in Palestine uh, texting how to deal with, you know, tear gas. And um, and sometimes at rallies, you see, you know, African-Americans wearing shirts that say Gaza, you know, free Palestine or whatever. And I think Palestinians have also been very involved in um, increasingly in a lot of the um, injustices going on here for, um, you know, African-Americans, Native Americans, um, wide group of <laughs> the list is long after that. Um, but so I think it's changing. I do. I do think that people are having to justify a little bit more if they take that position that Palestine is somehow different. Uh, but it is a, a really long, um, really ingrained um, history that that people have to contend with now. It's it's it was very comfortable. I mean, you know, even 20 years ago, I think there was no qualms about saying all sorts of crazy things about Palestinians in the same sentence as talking about how, you know, what a fighter for justice you are in other contexts. And, um, and I just think that's partially dearth of dearth of narrative. I mean, I think we have, and I think that's why Saeed spoke about the importance of getting our stories out there and, and telling people 
um, what's really going on. And that's why it's so detrimental when, you know, social media platforms crack down on our ability to do that. And when Israelis target um, our spokespeople and our journalists and, um, and it's, you know, it's, it's an uphill battle, but I think we're fighting it. <laughs> Yeah, that's for sure. I mean, you mentioned so many things that uh, I, I definitely want to stop and sort of probe them a bit further because you mentioned social media and just most recently, uh, Meta, which is the mother uh, company of uh, Facebook, they acknowledged that they basically, you know, uh, sort of uh, prevented the Palestinians from speaking their point of view during the Israeli war on Gaza in, in 2021, May 2021. So this, this happened I mean, if this happens now, or it's happening uh, now, you also mentioned Ferguson, which is uh, Ferguson, which is a, a, a great moment, I think, in terms. Of, of course, it's a tragic moment, but also it's a, an important moment in uh, solidifying the solidarity between Palestinians and African Americans, and so on. You know, uh, Black Lives Matter, for instance. You know, it, there's a great deal of solidarity between the Palestinians and the Black Lives Matter movement, and vice versa. The article that I mentioned in 538 uh, a couple of days ago actually mentioned that as a watershed moment, as, as an important uh, event in solidifying that uh, that connectedness and that uh, position. Although, I mean, you know, people have paid uh, prices. I mean, uh, Lamont Hill uh, paid a price and was thrown out, and uh, others have. There was targeting of um, Joseph Massad at Columbia and uh, of, you know many others, she had many uh, others I can go on uh, and on, but things are happening. I mean, just last week, uh, we saw how uh, nervous and unglued they have come uh, because uh, Rashida Tlaib, uh, an American congresswoman, you know, uh, you know, Palestinian American congresswoman, uh, said that it's, you can't be progressive except for Palestine. I mean, which is true. You can't be progressive except uh, for Palestine. So these things, are really um, uh, happening, or at least we're beginning to see uh, some movement, uh, and that is, you know, cause for optimism. Uh, I, I think. I mean, I, I have no doubt that uh, first and foremost, uh, the Palestinians by resisting the Israeli occupation, and uh, you know, getting the story beyond just the con the confines of the occupation into the broader world out there, uh, is by itself is, is has a tremendous impact. And then, you know, those who are you know, whether in this country, Europe, anywhere, you know, Africa, the rest of the Arab world, uh, and so on, um, also uh, uh, can uh, lend their support and, and, uh, and uh, you know, to, to this struggle that is uh, ongoing. Uh, I wanted to ask you uh, about, let's say, uh, so many anniversaries we have in, in September. I mean, you know, one, one of course, is the Sabra and Shakira massacre, which is a very sad thing. We had an event here last week, uh, you know, uh, on this, uh, but also, uh, you know, something that the U.S. celebrate uh, that celebrated, which is uh, the Oslo Accord, which have failed miserably in uh, bringing any kind of resolution to the Palestinian Israeli uh, conflict. They also, on the 15th of September, they celebrated the, the second anniversary of the so-called uh, Abraham uh, Accord. You know, which is really a phony term because uh, you know, I mean, it's one understands you know, the Camp David Accord. They're called that way because they have it in Camp David. Uh, but you know, as a, an issue that I raised in the State Department, I mean, what kind of a phony name is that? Well, it was not a guy named Abraham that basically you know oversaw uh, these uh, accords and and so on. So, I mean, going back to uh, Edward Said and 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 his days and 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 his presentations and about the role of you know, the, the support system out there in the Arab world. How do you see, if, if you are, I mean, if you are in, 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 interested in this issue, this normalization process, how do you see it as counterproductive? Um, I mean, I, I think it's really dangerous and counterproductive and um, destructive. And, um, um, I think on an emotional level, it's difficult to stomach as a Palestinian that it happened, you know, um, <laughs> that these things happen. And I think in terms of politically, it's really damaging um, 
it's really destructive to pretend like things are better than they are and then to have um you know um fellow arabs basically fellow arab governments um turn a blind eye so i i think it's um i think it's also in the vein of you know all the dialogue uh, efforts that there um were really popular for a long time except obviously on a governmental level it's even more um damaging and destructive i think to pretend that you can just gloss over what's happening um i think um I don't know exactly. I mean, I think that that's for the people whose governments are, you know, the, most of those governments are oppressing their own people, <laughs> first and foremost, before they're betraying Palestinians. So I, I don't think that's, um, it's something that has to come from within those own governments that within, within those own, their countries that have to pressure their governments to change. And I think popular opinion in most of those countries is not for um normalization i don't i don't uh you know i don't have facts and figures to back that up but my sense is that that's not a popular opinion as much as it is a governmental level um decision for political expedience and convenience um and to please the us and um you know obviously it would be great to be in a world where we don't have arab governments that um cater more to foreign governments than they do to their the well-being of their own people and their neighbors, the people of the people in their neighboring countries. But um, yeah, I mean, I don't have a whole lot to say other than right. other than that. <laughs> I, I tell you what, I, I, the reason I raise this is because we're talking about how the Palestinian cause is actually gaining support and traction uh, among the peoples of the world. And, uh, and Israel says, look, you know, we are having peace with all these Arab governments. Nobody cares about the Palestinians. Nobody cares about what is really happening to them. So there is a very, you know, sinister and even cynical thing about about this, and uh, and of course, as you mentioned, Arab governments fall in this. I mean, there are governments that have um, you know, normalized with uh, uh, Israel before, because as a result of conflict, Egypt and Camp David, Jordan and Wadi Araba, and so on. But you know, for the the normalization that we have seen uh, in the last, you know, a couple of years ago with um, the Emirates, Bahrain, Maghrib, and Sudan, and so on. And it is basically, it was something really to uh, obfuscate the, the, the Palestinian cause. I mean, it is in, its intention, and they are uh, part of it, you know, these governments, um, by, you know, wittingly or unwittingly, by normalizing. They are part of this effort, it's part of marginalizing the Palestinian cause, it's part of keeping the Palestinian under control, it's part of of legalizing and legitimizing, not legalizing, legitimizing um, um, settlements and, and normalizing the killing of Palestinians and so on. I mean, this is probably there's in the last month have witnessed the uh, period of uh, most brutal uh, conduct of any Israeli government. And, you know, we we, we have, uh, because uh, the, the US now, uh, we're jumping into another topic, because the U.S. wants maybe wants the P to stay in power and so on, and that may give him some uh, bolster his credential as uh, someone who can repress the Palestinians just as good as Netanyahu did or, or any other and remain uh, in, in power. But it's uh, uh, it is uh, I mean uh, it's a world of difference. You have on the one hand these governments, and you have on the other hand there are people that you mentioned people throughout uh, the world. I have to ask you about the two-state solution. It is something that, you know, that the, the Americans, it's just like, a, it's a euphemism, you know, to, it's a response to all things. I mean, so uh, to sort of abandon responsibility or not to assume responsibility and to hide behind it. It's a, it's a fake belief and it's a can that they can kick down the road, uh, you know, so, and go on and, you know, just life goes on, so to speak, from one administration uh, to, to the other. I wanted to ask you, about um, the, the, the viability or, or lack of viability or the fallacy of the two-state solution. In the, in the context of what we see today in terms of, in many ways, an appetite system. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's I think it's a fiction. I think it's yeah. impossible on the ground. I think um, the number of settlements and um, 
and and settlers uh, alone make it uh, nearly impossible. I think it was a pretty untenable idea from the beginning. Uh, I think that any attempts to actually codify anything like a two-state solution, like the Oslo Accords, were an abomination and um, really just uh, codified a whole lot of really troubling aspects of the occupation and then created a, a native authority basically to oversee that and to police the Palestinians into acquiescing to it. So I don't see any signs of any nascent or um, ongoing promise for a two-state solution. And I think um, uh, that imagining how it would be implemented is really um really difficult for me um, to, I, and I think that um, a one state, I think one state, I think one state that upholds the principles that we expect of states in, in this day and age in terms of, and I mean, a lot, um, of course, violate a lot of these things, but at least the bare minimum of an equal state um, with equal rights for its citizens, um, not based on religion or ethnicity, and um, where everybody can own land and everybody can live and um, have their families and have a future. Uh, I think I think it's a, a very basic and fundamental idea, and it's the only one that has any promise as, as far as I can tell. Well, what we have today is a one state. It is the Israeli state. Uh, there is, you know, uh, a state for um, one group of people and another group is totally occupied and subjected to discriminatory laws and, and, and so on. Uh, so this has been really a, a, an outstanding time spent with you uh, to discuss uh, these issues. It was comprehensive. Uh, I wanted to ask you before we, uh, we end, how to access your presentation. That you uh, is that what you asked me? Yeah. Uh, how how uh, my young colleague Daras uh, wanted to ask how to access your presentation that you just made today with us. Um, you mean the paper copy? Uh, is that what you mean? Yeah. yeah. Paper yeah. copy. Is it something that you can share with us, uh, or I can send it to yeah. you. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, that's fantastic. Well, thank you very much. You know, it's great to meet you. We hope that. We will have um, other opportunities in the future. Um, we have uh, our uh, annual conference is going to be on the 11th uh, of November. If you're in this part uh, of the country, please come. It's going to be our first in-person uh, event. You know, it's going to be, of course, part Zoom and part uh, in, in person. We hope that we'll have a um, uh, full house on that day. Keep mark your calendar and join us if you can. Thank you very much. And we are very much. Thank you.